Hi, welcome to our CE340 structural analysis sequence. This is the first video in our semester long study of classical methods of structures uh, revolving mostly around determination of loads, load combinations, determinant structures, and then finally ending with a, a foray into some indeterminate applications toward the end of the semester. In this video today, we're going to focus mainly on structural identification and forms. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get ourselves started. So we're going to begin our study by Kind of taking a brief stroll through history and some of the more iconic structures of both the past and the in the modern era and the point of this is, is that in order to be able to perform any sort of structural analysis we have to be able to create a model of the physical world so that you know whether i'm doing a hand calculation or using some computer application we have to be able to translate the reality into something that we can work with as far as our understanding goes. Now, in a theoretical sense, we're talking about using Newton's laws or principles of mechanics and materials or those kind of things to set up our initial runs. Um, this class will not focus much on computer analysis and some of the, the matrix methods of solution, although for those of you that are actually enrolled in the class, we'll be dealing with um, on a kind of an individualized basis, some um, structural analysis software packages that will be used. But for those of you that are not part of the class, that will be beyond the scope of the set of videos. So what we'll start is we'll get ourselves underway here. Okay, and so I kind of talk about some of the more iconic and history changing uh, structures. All right, now the first one up I know is, this is probably a little bit dated, and as we know, in the, in the past couple of years, no tragedy has befallen this structure, but this is one of the most iconic structures that man has ever made, okay? And it was, you know, built in, you know, obviously in the 1100s. Um, it's the Notre Dame um, de Paris Cathedral located in Paris, France. And what made this so iconic was is that this structure was done completely without calculations and completely done without computers, obviously, because of the time frame. But as they were building it, they experienced some, some issues with the bowing of the walls and just these structures were grand and very, you know, and just massive and, some, and just forces, you know, unlike anything that had been seen. And with the bowing of the walls, they had a problem that, you know, the structure would collapse if they didn't do something to stabilize it. And so you can kind of see over in this portion here, I don't know if you can see the mouse cursor, I think you can, over here are these, these iconic, you know, the, the flying buttresses, if you will, that help to stabilize this structure. Now obviously in the last couple of years, this, this having been filmed in 2020, this structure has since been you know, destroyed by fire with plans to rebuild, but it's still kind of, it, it, it's a tremendous symbol to the world of structural engineering on you know, man's ability to be able to to, to solve problems, you know, and to always be using engineering judgment and to be able to, 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 to handle a potential crisis in that, in that sense. So um, that's why I've chosen to go ahead and leave this one in our discussion here. But the flying buttresses and the cathedral um, construction in Notre Dame and really any cathedral construction, you know, from, the, you know, from, from a millennia ago, um, the you know, all religious based structures were, were just, just tremendous and the, the cathedrals of Europe were amazing and so we leave that one on our list. Okay, um, Another cathedral is um, the Duomo Cathedral which is located in Florence, Italy. This was built a little bit later than Notre Dame but this one boasts the third largest you know, dome in the world to date. Um, it's still the largest masonry brick dome in existence, um, it's it's a massive structure, and so um, and so again, a lot of a lot of you know cathedral construction and, and principal ideas, and you can see that we've got kind of you know some you know some, would be a you know a dome or an arch behavior that happens to happen here, and being able to do this with masonry was it was very amazing. Um, they use a system of you know bricks and blocks, and then you know iron chains 
to be able to kind of provide tension because as you'll see the certain elements are better with tension certain elements are better in compression and some can do the job really well and some can't and so we come up with these hybrid systems this structure was iconic and that this was the break from the gothic era that you saw in the notre dame cathedral the the, the italian renaissance kicked off in one of the um earliest examples of that was just the change in the appearance and the look of the structures and so this was one of the triggering effects of the Italian Renaissance from a, from a structural standpoint and then change from this Gothic architecture style that you saw in Notre Dame or you know any of the other major cathedrals to this style it's, it's still the shape is very similar but just the construction practices and the construction techniques are very very different and so this is a very very iconic structure the Il Duomo Cathedral right? The Firth of Forth Railway Bridge, it was um, at the time of its building, is a was was a, was a cast iron railway bridge over the Firth of Forth. This is north of Edinburgh, Scotland, and so this is what we call as a cantilever truss type, in which you have a support system located at the bottom, and then these what kind of look like diamond shapes, you know, cantilever out to both sides. And then if you look over here in the middle. You know, between these cantilever trusses, there's a little bitty, you know, gap truss that's used to connect from here to here. Now, this is still an active railway. This was built in the late 1800s, and it's still an active railway. I've ridden across a train that went across this line. And so it's, um, you know, again, all for purposes of building and making things grander and to solve a purpose. This is a very active waterway happening here, and so they needed clear space to be able to get the boats up and down the, the, the first of fourth for, for shipping purposes and even to this day it's still a very very active waterway so it's a, a very iconic structure from you know, from Scotland right. more recently um, the the most notable structure is probably Burj Khalifa okay now at the time again of this this video it is the tallest structure in the world there are structures under construction now that will surpass that but this is 2010 in Dubai in the Middle East in the United Arab Emirates. Okay, and so this is you know very iconic. This is a kind of an interesting structure in that it is a concrete core with kind of a steel and metal outer frame around the outside of this thing. Okay, so so you'll hear this one talked about quite a bit. You know, um, it's still like I say the tallest in the world for that. Um, Dubai is actually a hotbed of not only architectural wonders but you know structurally interesting. Um, facilities. The first one um, that you see on the left here is the Burj Al Arab Jumeirah. Okay, this is, I believe, is actually a hotel. And again, they're doing things with concrete and steel and building grand structures. You can see the size of the, the city back behind on all of this. Okay, and so it's a, um, but this one was built to resemble a kind of a sail on a boat shape because this is, you know, a coastal city. Um, the Aldar headquarters, also in Dubai, was built to look more like, you know, like an Oculus lens, you know, kind of an old, an old time telescope lens for being able to see far distances. This is the Aldar headquarters, which I believe is a construction company um, in Dubai. And so again, all different, uniquely uh, functional structures that are, you know, intended purposes vary, and as well as their construction techniques and some very unique challenges. So, you know, Dubai is a very exciting place just based off of these last three photos. And someday I hope to get there to be able to see this stuff in person. Okay. All right. Um, more locally to us in the U.S. and in particular in the, in the Midwest, um, St. Louis is a little ways away from where we're located. And there are a couple of iconic structures. And I always like this photo because it shows kind of the modern with, not ancient, but, you know, but the... Uh, you know, more timely, I guess, is probably a good word for it. On the left, you see the Gateway Arch. This was completed in 1965, okay, and was a Cantonary arch structure. Okay, if you've ever been to the St. Louis Arch, there's a, a tremendous video showing how this thing was built and the challenges that were associated with it. It's a, it's a, overall, it's a very simple structure, but the, the, um, the construction provided some very unique challenges, especially with the orientation and the sun and trying to get those last pieces in. So if you ever get a chance, I would recommend, you know, definitely watch that video. I'd say that's it's pretty amazing. Those of you in my class, I'll try to set this up so we can see it if you um, kind of as well. On the right is the Eads Bridge, okay? And this is a, kind of a pretty iconic structure, at least in the United States, and that this was the first steel bridge um, that was built. Okay, it was 
wasn't designed by an engineer. It was designed by a riverboat salvage operator that used to go up and down the Mississippi River. And again, this is over the Mississippi River going into St. Louis. And so you can see that the, the shape of the structure and the evolution of the materials from, uh, from, from some of those. You know, this was actually even before the Firth of Forth that we saw a little bit earlier, but this was our, our first uh, steel, uh, steel bridge, if you will. And it's very, it's very slender and very elegant and um, was a means of being able to, put, to ferry horses and transports across the river and not have to wait on the boats to be able to go across. It allowed just direct access across across the bridge, but it's an absolutely, I think it's a very, a very attractive looking bridge as the case may be. Okay. okay. Also in St. Louis is a structure that's a little bit more near and dear to my heart. Um, this is the, uh, used to be the Trans World Dome. It's now the Dome at America's Center. Okay. Um, it's also been known as the Edward R. Jones Dome. This was built in um, the mid nineties. This was actually the first structure I worked on after I graduated from, from my undergraduate degree. And so I worked on this little bitty portion that was over here along with a whole team of engineers, but you know, being a young engineer fresh out and getting put on this project was pretty exciting for us. And so I got to work on some of the, the, the design of these, these truss joists, if you will. There are these big barrel joists, truss systems that span from one wall to the other, and then they have lots of little pieces that span between those barrel joists. Okay, and this was a particularly interesting development for analysis in that my job was to try to get all the deflections in this region so that they would be similar in nature. And that's a challenge. If you remember back to mechanics materials, deflection on beams and joists are a function of, you know, either L squared, L cubed, or L to the fourth, depending on the load. And these L's are not the same. You had really short guys here on the end and really long guys here on the middle. And so it became a bit of a challenge trying to work those. And I remember working some long hours trying to get all those numbers to work out. And proud to say the structure hasn't collapsed yet, so hopefully it's still safe. You know, that's a joke, by the way. So anyway, um, so, so but again, this is in St. Louis. So to me, you know, you know, the world of structures in my mind is, you know, very critical in, in, the, in the St. Louis, Missouri area. Okay. Um, other iconic structures that, that vary um, over the eons and over the time, uh, we've got the Taj Mahal. Um, this is uh, fairly, this is in Agra, India. And you can see we've got the use of arches and, you know, simple, simple box walls and some, some big domes, those kind of things. And even before that, the, the Romans, you know, were you know, credited with the development of the arch in their, in their structures. We had the, the Colosseum in Rome, Italy. Um, this was a picture I took probably back in 2014. Um, with, a, with an awesome sunset, but you can see that the, the structure, while it's fairly simple, you know, it was, you know, it consisted of a whole bunch of arches doing a whole bunch of work, and so you have your column members happening up and down here, and then you've got some sort of arch behavior over the top. It's not quite a lintel, post and lintel construction like you might see in ancient Greece, but it is a, a structure that is seen all throughout ancient Roman times. You know, you know, for you know, for thousands and thousands of years, it's the way that this has been, and then, again, a very amazing structure as well. Okay, um, again, coming back to the United States, if you say the word suspension bridge, at least in the United States, the one that pops to mind is the Golden Gate Bridge. This is located in San Francisco, connects the city of San Francisco with uh, with Oakland. Okay, across the across the bay. Um, There's another one. I you know I would have, someday I would like to to be able to go and see the structure. But I haven't made haven't haven't made it yet. Uh, but you can see that you know with suspension bridges, there's a different functional form. This isn't you know you know a post and lintel you know column or beam type of construction. This is more of a you know obviously it's a suspension bridge because you have the bridge deck that is hung from cables. These are the primary cables, okay. And then I have hangers that are coming up and down vertically uh, from the cable down to the bridge deck and. You know, then the cables are hung from towers, and that's how they're able to do it. But they're able to do vast, vast distances. Now, Golden Gate is by no means the longest suspension bridge in the world, but you know, but it does the job. And you can see now we get from what we saw in the Firth of Forth, you know, 130 years ago, to now Golden Gate, which was built, you know, probably 50, 60 years after that. And look at these long distances that exist, and that's good because now, again, we're opening things up to tra traffic. I don't have to worry about boats slamming into supports or those kind of things. But it all became as a result of the evolution of the materials, and so our material study will become an issue 
that we'll talk about as we start to move forward in the world of structural analysis. These structures behave very differently. Um, one thing that's beneficial about a suspension bridge is that in high seismic zones, the structure will sway under the, the, the earthquake effects. And then once the earthquake event stops, if it's designed right, it will come right back to its original position. So suspension bridges are very, very popular in high seismically active regions for that very reason, is that they become a resilient, flexible structure. Okay, it is a, you know, a rigid type of implementation. So, so that's Golden Gate. Okay, um, we have the Malau Viaduct. This is um, the world's tallest cable state bridge, and so this is yet another bridge. This is um, located in southern France near Malau, and what, you, what it did is it basically took hours off of a travel time. You can kind of see this road that kind of winds around back in the background here, and then you go um, you know, down through the valley and come up the other side, and this cut you know, a lot of time off of a major transportation hub um, in that part and provided a huge economic boom. This is the world's tallest cable stay bridge. You can get a sense of the size of the towers by looking at these buildings that are way down here on the end. You get a sense of how tall this structure is. There are pictures of this bridge where the top of the bridge is sticking up through the clouds when the fog rolls in, you know, in, into this region. And so this is a, a different structure. This is a lot more stiff than what we saw with the suspension bridges in that you have a centralized tower and then you have your bridge deck obviously that part's still the same but instead of being a draped cable from one tower to the next with hangers the cables are now drawing directly down you know onto the deck at certain intervals to help hold up the deck now cable stage has become a lot more increasingly popular in recent years um, there, again in st louis there's a new bridge the i-70 bridge over the mississippi river is a cable stage type of type of structure this is a single cable, whereas a lot of times you'll have doubles coming down and grabbing both sides. There's even one you know, more close to home near Owensboro that is a cable stayed type of bridge as well. And so all different types of structures, and they behave you know, you know, very, very differently from one to the other. And they all have their benefits, and they all have their, per you know, you know, their, their disadvantages. Uh, one of the disadvantages you see on the cable stayed is with the suspension bridge, they had a very, 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 very long span and didn't have to have intermediate towers, whereas these now, because of the nature of the structure itself, I have to have towers fairly close together in order to be able to accommodate these tension cables that are coming down to pick up the deck. Okay. Um, and for, and as structural engineers, we never want things to go wrong, but sometimes things don't go right, and there are a lot of causes for when things don't quite work out the way that we wanted. Um, things like natural disasters, designs and analysis analysis mistakes, um, unforeseen accidents, and then even intentional acts such as you know, terrorism and those kind of things um, all provide challenges that structural engineers are trying to consider. Now obviously in the case of you know, unforeseen accidents and some of these, um, these more intentional acts that we don't, um, um, it, it's hard to, to prepare for all of those possible cases because a lot of times we can't even imagine the case that, of when it's going to happen. Okay. All right. Um, one of the more iconic ones is obviously the, is the, the Tower of Pisa, located in Pisa, Italy. This is um, 1173, 1372 is when it was built, um, and so um, it has the, it's the old iconic, you know, leaning structure. I think it leans something like 16 or 17 degrees off of the vertical, and that was caused, they believe, by um, a soil settlement under one part of the of the tower. There was an underground conduit or or moisture channel that apparently changed the soil conditions on one part and so when you get into your foundation design or your foundation analysis classes it caused one side of the structure to 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 settle if you will and the structure continued to go and over the years they've done things to stabilize it so hopefully now it's not going to go any further but it's still pretty iconic you can actually you know, you know pay I forget what the fee was, it was something like 20 euro or something that you could actually walk up this tower that you're, I chose not to do it but um, you can actually Walk up that, walk up the up the tower as part of a kind of a touristy gimmick in the in the in the plaza here in Pisa. Okay, um, another one. And I apologize for the quality of this video. Uh, I think most of us, uh, at least in the U.S., have probably seen this one. This is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This is that old black and white uh, video with the car going across the bridge. It's swaying back and forth. It's uh, nicknamed Galloping Gertie. If you remember, there was a car in the middle of the bridge, and this thing was. You know, wobbling all over the place. Um, I, I, th this is worth the, the couple of minute view that you can find on a YouTube video or on a, on a, on a Google search. Just look up Tacoma Narrows and you'll find this video will be plastered you know, a thousand times 
And so I'll leave that one as kind of an exercise at first. If you haven't seen it, otherwise, I remember I saw this for the first time on a video in like the seventh or eighth grade, and this was like, wow. So even though the structure, you know, was a was a was a suspension type bridge, it's a very flexible system. This thing was rocking, you know, up on this side and down, you know, and it was just all over the place before it finally collapsed. But this was a design flaw that they hadn't considered. It turns out that the bridge spanned across a chasm. And what they believed was the, the triggering effect was was that the, the wind coming down through that river valley, the, 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 that it caused a, a cyclic loading on the structure, you know, based on the speed of the wind, the natural frequency of the structure matched the frequency and something called resonance occurred. And so it, it, it magnified the deflection until a point where the structure couldn't withstand it anymore. But this thing was moving, you know, tens of feet up and down. It was pretty, pretty wild. So, but again, there was a, a, a design issue um, for as far as structural dynamics and it's become a case study for, you know, things on how to, how to repair those and how to, um, to better design things in the future. Because you know, it's one thing if a structure fails, but we want to try to learn something from it so that we don't repeat our mistakes in the past, you know. Okay, um, there's the, the case of the Vikings Metrodome. Okay, this was taken out of you know, out of service in 2010, but it experienced five roof collapses over the course of its life, okay, and that was in a, like a 30-year period, built in 81, or the first collapse was in 81, and then it, it collapsed finally in 2010, but this was an inflated structure, it was kind of a balloon structure, and so it was, it, it collapsed due to snow loads on it. And so, you know, again, I talk about trying to learn from your mistakes. Well, <laughs> I guess they didn't really learn if it collapsed five times. But, um, but this, this structure has since been replaced with a, with a newer facility. This is the home of the Minnesota Vikings uh, football team, or was at the time. Okay, and so it's, um, again, just um, kind of snow loads in northern Minnesota, or I guess not northern Minnesota, but in Minnesota can get fairly substantial. But this was a, and it was an interesting interesting structure to say in the least. Um, there's the, the 1977 City Corps uh, Center design flaw. Okay, this is the City Corps building located in New York City and it's pretty well known not because of the structural issue but because this became a case study in ethics. Okay, and part of the deal was that there was this old church that was kind of underneath and real estate in, in New York City is at a premium and they wanted to build this structure. Well, you know, the footprint for putting this building in they had to come up with a way to be able to, to you know, preserve a church that was down underneath one corner of it, from my understanding. And the the, the lead engineer on this structure designed a system that, you know, did did his due diligence and set up to 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 do his calculations and design the structure, and it was fine. But it was um, it wasn't until later, after the structure had already been built, that it was discovered. And it was discovered by I think it was either a graduate student or maybe an undergraduate, but I think it was a graduate student that you know he had a question as he was doing a research paper on this building, where he contacted the engineer and said, "Well, did you consider the effects of quartering winds?" And a quartering wind is imagine you know a wind coming you know perpendicular to each of these walls. Okay, a quartering wind would be one that's coming straight in at like 45 degrees to those two walls coming across the diagonal. And as you see, we've got a series of supports that it's actually it was a, actually a higher stress situation than um, than what you would get from the other case. And for some reason, it, um, it was either overlooked or wasn't caught at the time. And so what they what they did is that the the engineer of record of this particular building was. Um, I mean, he had a dilemma. That, you know, he had a building that was fully constructed, hadn't seen its design loads from that quartering effect, but if that design case ever occurred, it would be a major, major problem. Now, I don't know if the building would have fallen down, but it would have been, you know, very, very extreme in, in the damage that was done and, you know, you know, to the people below or even the people in the building. Um, and so, you know, he had to kind of, you know, decide, well, did, you know, does he pretend that he doesn't know that there's a problem or does he step forward and take it. Um, my understanding is the man contemplated suicide as a result of the pressure but eventually did the right thing and came forward and they were able to make the repairs and to be able to solve this problem. I'm not exactly sure how they did it but kind of this this guy becomes kind of a kind of study in ethics and kind of the, the principle of owning up to what the design, uh, you know, to, to, to your responsibilities as a, as a civil structural engineer. Yeah. Right. Um, in 2001 uh, we have the 9-11 
uh, terrorist events that were um, that took down the, the World Trade Center, both towers of it. Um, like I said, there's nothing you can really do to design for this kind of thing. The structure was you know, adequately designed and for a while was the tallest building in the world. Okay, but then when the aircraft hit the building, then it basically destroyed the upper floors and then as fire and damage uh, precipitated through the building, the, the rest of the tower came down. Uh, this was a direct result of the of, you know, terrorist attacks um, on New York City. So, um, we have the Shanghai 13-story um, uh, apartment structures. Um, this one's kind of interesting. Um, you may study this one in your geotechnical engineering class because this is more of a foundations failure than anything. You can see that this building is still reasonably well intact. Okay, I always kind of wondered about this, you know, that basically this building was originally located vertically. You can see the others that are still standing over here on the side, but I look at the, the minimal amount of connection on the bottom of this thing kind of made me wonder, but apparently this building collapsed and just basically fell over due to excavations on the soft side of the earth of this thing. So I would say that structurally this was a pretty successful building that it stayed together despite the connection to the earth, but this one always kind of goes to, to lead me to remember that, you know, a structure is only as good as its foundation, right? You've got to get the foundation design right, whether it's, you know, a shallow foundation or some sort of deep pierce foundation in order to be able to, do, for the building to do the job that's intended. So structural engineers and geotechnical engineers spend a lot of time working together and, and working together to be able to accomplish the task. So, you know, like I said, a structural engineer can only do so much if the building's not going to stay up. So this one's just kind of a, a steady reminder of that interplay of, you know, not just buildings, but also earth and geotech and materials around it. Okay, um, and we have a, a the Morandi Bridge collapse that was in uh, Genoa, Italy, in 2018. Okay, in which basically uh, there's a bridge that goes over this kind of this industrial residential area and connects the highway from one side to the other, the A10. Okay, and then the Morandi Bridge, and then basically at the the, the, the time of this recording, the the, the, the tower had collapsed for some reason, and so this was still being under in, uh, under inspection for what was the cause of that. All right. Um, so, you know, with a few of those, a lot of different pictures came at you pretty quick on there. So the question becomes, well, how do we start? You know, and you know, as we mentioned earlier, the, the first thing we have to do is we have to be able to get into structural identification. Okay, being able to identify well what kind of structure is, and, and once I can do that, I can determine how the forces flow through the system, and once I do that, that allows me to be able to draw the free body diagrams. Okay, so some of the more important structures that you'll see, and I'll refer you to your textbook to be able to read up on the rest of these, but just to kind of summarize, okay, we have things like tension structures, okay, basically um, the, the suspension bridges and the cable stay bridges are predominantly tension structures. The main cable is in tension, the hangers are in tension, and so we're able to, you know, to be able to to, to study things like tension rods or even internal members inside of bolt trusses. You know, the, the tensile stress is distributed uniformly over the cross sections of the members and um, the cables are flexible and can only support tension and, and those would be, that would be one type of tension member and those are just your, your simple, you know, sigma equals force over area type of calculations is the basis for the design of them, okay. The compression structures are a little bit different. These are often a lot more complex because now you get into things like slenderness and you know very long columns behave differently than very short columns for the same section. Uh, the geometry of the column and the length of the column starts to play a major role in its strength uh, due to the, to the nature of buckling. Okay, and so um, especially in actually loaded columns, buckling is a major concern when you get to steel design or concrete design. You'll be studying those. Um, a lot. Um, there are other compression structures. The Roman arches were a compression type structure, but they were very short and very stiff, so buckling wasn't really a concern, and they were very highly effective in compression. All right, uh, that leads us into our bending structures. So we've, we've had tension loads, we've had compression loads, and then there's the, the bending or the flexural loads. Okay, and so here we have a picture of a simply supported beam with a point load in the middle. And so this will develop not only, if you remember back from basic statics, you'll develop you know, shear diagrams and moment diagrams. Well, shear causes shear stresses and moment causes normal stresses. And their interaction becomes a major design characteristic when you get into design. And so one of the things we'll study is you know, how to generate the, the shear and moment diagrams. I'm sure you've seen a little bit of that in your mechanics materials and your statics class, but we'll go over that in some pretty good detail. And I'll show you some shortcuts and some tricks and what we can do with it. And then because that becomes the basis of design when you get to steel design and concrete design in the next in the coming semesters. 
Okay, um, and it can be beams, it can be joists like you saw in the, in the, in the, in the Edward R. Jones um, dome that I worked on in St. Louis. Um, it's also an issue in rigid frames, slabs, plates, it's uh, flexure is everywhere. Okay, so if it's not pure tension, it's not pure compression, it's going to be a flexural member of some sort almost always. Okay, um, we get into combinations of systems. This would be kind of an example of of a, of a truss system and as you remember trusses have both compression members and tension members and so this guy gets designed for all of these this is kind of a kind of a not quite a steel joist type of setup this is similar to what you would have seen in the top of that st louis dome that i worked on and so um, for just a simple simple type of truss you know and this one's actually a little bit more complex in that it's actually tied to the columns as well so we get some interesting behaviors up here in these connection areas which um, we won't explore a whole lot in this class, but once you get into steel design and, and concrete design, that will become another major, major area of, of design. We'll focus mainly on how do we identify the forces, how can we estimate the deflections that occur in this particular roof, and that will be one of the things that we look at. But this is a, a kind of an interesting picture in showing how you know, structural elements go together, and that will be another major area in this particular class. We're going to talk a little bit about structural framing and how do we put these pieces together so that we have a structurally stable system. This one's kind of fun that you can see the different frames that are existing, you know, one in every one of the columns coming across here, okay, and then, but what's preventing this thing from falling over laterally? And you can see that, you know, all they've done is they've tied kind of this K, this K brace, if you will, it's back, a backwards K because it's on the other side of the building, that locks the top of this column to the middle of the next one and locks to the bottom of this one. And by stabilizing this entire structure, it looks like there's some sort of, you know, kind of concrete rail or precast rail that's happening here. That by locking these two together, then this is tied to the next one, and that one's tied to the next one, and so forth. You've now effectively stabilized the entire structure just with a single brace here. Although now that I look, I see there's one back in the back. So they've done actually done at both ends. Okay, and for industrial applications, the location of this bracing becomes a major point, right? Because, you know, maybe I want to put, you know, some sort of, you know, access doors for, you know, tractor trailers or something to come into the building to unload your goods. Well, I can't have a brace going through there, right? You know, if it's a little, you know, you know six-foot door, maybe I could fit that over here in this corner, but I can't get a full-size garage door, you know, in this end bay. And so, kind of your structural layout and your location of your elements will be an exercise that we'll, we'll work on in a couple of weeks kind of just giving you kind of a taste of the actual structural layout and deciding where things to go and then that will lead you into how do you frame things and I think that will be a good exercise for this class as well. All right, um, we've talked about the arches. These are some of the, uh, the, Roman, ar um, uh, the Roman arches. These are, this is one of the aqueducts in Seville, Spain. And you can go all throughout Europe and you know, the ancient Roman Empire and see evidence of these, of these arches still, you know, still in existence today. They're massive structures, they're gorgeous. So um, we won't study a whole lot about the classic stone arch, like what you see here. Uh, we might talk about like a three-pin arch or you know some sort of more simplified arch structure, as as time permits. But um, but just again, that's more of an awareness of the behavior of the structure that we're looking for there. Um, we get kind of into some some moment frame type of systems where I have you know columns being connected by beams and concrete slabs over the top. Well, this structure behaves differently than an arch structure might and it behaves differently than a truss structure well but we have to be able to model this this is probably the most uh, representative of modern construction practices at least in the united states or is the is the design of the moment frames where the column takes and the shear forces in the column handle the lateral loads on the building and then the flexural effects are controlled by the beams and the columns themselves and so we can design this for wind or we can design this for seismic those all become different types of loadings that we want to uh, be able to accommodate and so I chose this kind of as a representative example of some, a different type of looking structure than what you might see there. Um, and, we'll, and we'll talk more about this as the, as the class starts to move on. Okay. Um, and then the last one that's kind of unique is the, is the topic of shear walls. And shear walls are often used in conjunction with moment frames, but what we can do is we can build a very flexible structure on the outside, and then I can put these very stiff walls, usually made out of concrete, um, and then basically tie the rest of the structure into it and you can see that if I push in this direction from left to right you know into the top corner of this this structure is very very stiff and very very rigid it will not deform laterally very much especially for shorter structures okay and then because I provided this rigid element this attracts a lot of the lateral loads into it and then I can just design this foundation you know for you know for an uplift on this corner and you know, pushing down on this corner and or vice versa depending on the direction of the wind 
and I have a very stiff element that can take big forces and basically translate them down into smaller forces that can be more manageable. It's a kind of an interesting phenomenon. This becomes more of an advanced design topic and it's more common in concrete construction, but it does work you know, kind of as a, as a major structural element. If you're, if you're walking around and you see what looks like a concrete shear wall, you know the behavior of the structure is not the same as in a moment frame. And we'll do some exercises that will kind of illustrate the differences and the effects that these walls have as well. And that will be kind of one of the, the, the things that we'll look at in this class. Okay. And with that, we'll go ahead and end our discussion of the, the, the structural identification of some of the basic forms. Now, there are a lot of other forms that we didn't cover in here, things like, you know, curved shells and, you know, and we didn't talk a whole lot about the domes that you saw in some of the earlier pictures. All of those will have their place. But, you know, for, uh, for you know, the first time out getting into structures, my goal is, is that as I want to make it so that as you're walking around in public, you're automatically looking around to see, you know, just kind of out of, out of curiosity, well, how, do, how is this structure put together? You know, how are these pieces put together? And that's, you know, if I can do that, then I would consider a mission accomplished, that it's no longer just a building. It's actually a system of pieces that behave differently, and that's what I'm trying to, to impart to you guys. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and end this discussion here today, and then we'll pick up next time. So if you'll stay tuned, we'll see you then. Um, as always, if you'll leave, you know, leave some feedback and let us know of any questions that you might have. And then you know, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and toss us a like on the video. We would greatly appreciate it. So um, have a great day and we will see you all next time. Thank you very much.